Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, the wrong line being read. <laughs> oh, man. And now, everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Michael Orlowski. Good morning, everyone. This is filmmaking from beginning to end, uh, editing to post-production. Uh, and joining me on my panel today is uh, founder of Scully Effects, Cully Bunker. <laughs> Supervising sound editor and sound designer, David Farmer. <laughs> TV and film producer for Alpha Entertainment Services, uh, Priscilla Rojas. <laughs> and uh, owner of 66 West Media, mixer and sound editor, Frank Schering. So yesterday, in this two-part series, uh, the, the, the theme uh, was preparing for production. And, and Larry Katz uh, mentioned that he loves to start with a script uh, and start immediately breaking down scenes and formulating a plan of a shooting schedule, uh, where Stephen Miller uh, was focusing on um, locations and wanting to get locations not only uh, early, but close together so that there was uh, limited company moves. Um, and, and throughout the entire presentation, there was just referring to that theme of being prepared and having a plan. Um, but in filmmaking, we know that with the best plans, production begins, and that plan can tend to go out the window, and you're kind of running um, wild in production. Uh, and when we get into post-production, we're forced, forced almost to, uh, as they say, fix it in post. Um, I wanted to start out by asking the panel um, how living in post-production, how you, how you feel with that, that statement, fix it in post, and, and how does that affect your your day-to-day -day, starting with you Colby. uh fix it in post is as um very heavily used mm -hmm. and uh i love it because it means money in my pocket so <laughs> if you mess up on on your shoot uh, I, I love you but uh sometimes it, it makes it very very difficult to do things because uh on on set you know time is money you've got what 15 20 30 40 50 people mm -hmm. so if they if they don't have time and they think they can make it up in post that's that's where it comes to um but it, it varies in the degrees of uh difficulties so mm -hmm. sometimes fix it compose can can uh cause big headaches and sometimes it's uh, it's easy money but we, we love to hear that word <laughs> so priscilla and as a as a producer yeah um I would think forced to pay pay the <laughs> the money for yeah. for for the opportunity to fix it in post how does that drive you when you get to the stage of editorial that's one of the most scary things from the producers because if you have to fix it in post it means money how he said and if you have the money awesome you can do it but pretty much in every project you don't have like too much money for that. So you have to try not to say, we fix it in post. And if we need to do it, obviously, we have to, I don't know, in some cases, you have to look for sponsors again, or try to find the money in a certain way, or trying to, that happens like, OK, we have to take this, I don't know, scene off if you need to. Or for example, um, in some cases, what you can do is like, well, let's see if we can talk with our director to see how we can figure out this, and with the editor. And that's sometimes it's important to have your, for example, uh, if you have the money to, the editor in pre-production. Mm. So you can start to think, okay, we need this scenes, we have this script, try to, what do you think about the script? What do you think about the shots that we have, our shot list? And they will tell you, okay, I think you need to put like more Focus on those. So that's pretty much if you have a, like the ideal budget, you can do that. Mm. Well, I, I find that the, the problem, like you said, is is we are at the tail end of all the production. So most of the time, all the money gets eaten up in production. Mm -hmm. And if there's mistakes, and there goes their 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 cushing money, and mm -hmm. then it is comes it? to us, and that it's always. Uh, this is a micro budget job. And, uh, <laughs> that's uh, being in the back end is really is really difficult in 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 the inter in the production line because the money runs out by the time mm -hmm. it gets to you a lot of the time. Nobody, only two people in my life and went, hey, you know what? I got extra money. <laughs> yeah, that that was nice. That was Those nice. guys get favors. Yeah. It's, not, it's not only the money; it's the time. Yeah. Yeah. Because if it gets delayed in in production, then and but there's still a deadline, so. We, we kind of get screwed 
twice. Well, it's all, with the editorial always is the one that. <laughs> yeah. They, they seem to have all the time, and the de deadlines never move, but the edit gets all the time in the world. So we were supposed to have a week, and then the edit goes long, and now we have two days to finish what we were supposed to do yeah. in a week. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. Now, David, you're, you're typically the last one in the pool yeah. with, with post sound. Yeah. So what, is, how do, what does fix it in post mean to you as a sound designer? Well, as a sound designer, fix it in post isn't that much of an issue because I'm usually at sound effects, I'm replacing everything anyway. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's what they expect. You know? <laughs> right. So uh, fix it in post for us usually means on the dialogue end, nasty dialogue has to be re-recorded. Um, and to your point about money, um, actors can be expensive. Yes. And you may have to re-record them many times, mm -hmm. depending on if they can perform it correctly. So dialogue editing is usually what gets fixed in post. Uh, for me, the, the biggest trouble becomes um, uh, bad picture edits, mm -hmm. which may be um, constrained by bad production, bad shot choices, and not enough shots to cover the to picture edit. You know, to make say a car chase. You know, right. for me, if a if a picture is cut well editorially, it naturally tends to sound good. You mm -hmm. know, the, the the ones that that are cut well sound better more effortlessly things that are that are have bad picture edits are sometimes really like forcing a square peg into a round hole to try to make it sound good and work so for us you know the fix it in post comes to poor shot choices right or editorial now frank you are in a unique position as a as an owner where you've produced all the way through uh to the post-production process and then end um usually doing uh final sound and, and picture. How often are you the cause of your, your own issues and how do you ju juggle that as the needs that you need to get done as a producer when you were shooting your documentary uh, to get it done, uh, to seeing yourself at the, on the other end of the, the timetable trying to put it together and get a product out? Uh, I'm the cause of my own problems every day. <laughs> every day. But... Uh, you, look, you just got to roll with it, and you, you do what you got to do to get it done. And and so, Mike worked with me on the film that I just finished, and uh, we actually finished it three times. Mm -hmm. Officially, a year ago, it was done, and we screened it, and then we redid pretty much the whole <laughs> film. You know, like recut it. But you know, what is that? You know, was that my fault? No. Was that someone's fault? No. It's just your all of this stuff comes down to telling a story. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, even to the fix it in post thing. It's mm -hmm. like, why are you fixing it in post? What are you, what are you fixing? Well, you're fixing a, something that's hindering the storytelling, you know? And so if I cause my own problem, then, you know, I just have to deal with it. And, oh, no. you know, and, and it's even harder now that I, I, my studio's in my house now. And, you know, even though I rarely sleep, but... If I do, you know, like if I actually go to bed and my alarm goes off, and I'm like, oh, you know, eh, another hour, mm -hmm. you know, and I just totally screwed myself. And now I'm going to be up another hour later, you know, right. that day. So now as as you've evolved your business, you I've, I've seen you go from really managing the final sound mixing to getting into with a, a partner into color correction and now have expanded your own setup to where you have the ability to do picture editing exports the, the the whole thing do you do you find that there's an added flexibility by learning how to do video editing on top of editing and mixing um as far as getting out of problems and, and maneuvering through the through the process of getting to the final product absolutely yeah and and the biggest difference is i don't have to outsource as much work to other people because i can handle the simple i'm not a picture editor, you know, but I can, mm -hmm. you know. So if it's simple, then it helps me because I don't have to pay somebody else to do it, you know. But I prefer not to do it. But you you have to you have to learn what you need to get your job done, whatever it is. And and in my case, it's you know I I was an employee at a post production house, then I owned a post production facility, and now I'm just me by myself you know and when you change roles like that you know you uh you have to broaden your your tool set mm -hmm. 
you know. And it, yeah. it's beneficial and it hurts at the same time, you know. It's like, well, I have to get that done, but then I have to do that. And, you know, I don't know really what I'm doing doing this and I'm screwing it up, you know, whatever. And then I call Cully and go, help me. <laughs> so Priscilla, uh, coming into um, the role of producing you know, kind of armed with your own studio on your on your laptop. How how active are you in the in the post production process as far as contributing to the the rest of the team? Well, that is a good question because I I'm not the one who edited the things that we do. Right now we are doing TV shows, so it's pretty much uh, like a similar, but it's not too much. But for example, we have an editor and have another editor in case he can do it or something. And what I pretty much tell them is like, okay, I have this idea. We made this interview, or we want to, I don't know, the other, we have a TV show that is about a tourism. Mm -hmm. And there, obviously, we have too many uh, locations that are like in the exterior. So obviously, we have probably with sometimes with audio, problem with, I don't know, um, the light. Uh, those type of things that obviously we have to say, okay, how are we going to fix it now in post? Mm -hmm. So pretty much every time that I give them like the, the footage or I don't know, the shot list or something, they tell me, oh my God, what are we gonna do right now? Mm -hmm. So we try to figure it out in a certain way. And obviously I always tell it, okay, I can see with you like by your side and tell you my idea. I can tell you if I like it or not, but I'm pretty not the one who added at all. Okay. Now, because I know there's, in certain ways you have to know what are your skills. Right. And I can produce, I can direct talent or whatever, but those things I prefer that my friends that are also from Full Sail do it, <laughs> that I know they're really good. It seems, um, with, with digital technology, there's, there's more ways for us to connect and get into the process um, earlier than, than we have before. Um, and it's, uh, I believe it needs to be a strategic uh, goal of post-production teams yep. to get into the production process as early as possible. And as business owners, uh, and even as freelancers, how are you justifying to your client, if I start editing in production, this is what your return on investment will be. Or if we start sound design in the editorial process, that here, here are the options that you wouldn't have if I start at the end. Frank, do you want to start as a? Well, I'm not quite sure how to answer that because the majority of my work is um, like a package price. So it's not mm -hmm. based on hours. Um, so, I mean, when, when you say justify to the, to the client, you know, it's, in my mind, I immediately go to money because they're always thinking about how mm -hmm. much am I spending, how much am I spending, you know, and, and time. But um, <laughs> it's never happened to, for me yet, but I, I, as a sound editor, I wish I could be involved in the pre-production, like, meetings. Mm -hmm. just so I understand, but it's never happened, you know? Mm -hmm. It's always, for, in the projects that I've worked on, it's always last minute, hey, we got this thing, can you do it? And right. I need it by Thursday, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? But, I mean, David maybe has had more opportunity to be involved early on um, in the feature world, but it, for me, it's just not something that I have the luxury of, you know? David, I, how early have you, do you get involved? Generally, not very. You know, um, the bigger projects, I would say, not to you know name any names or call anybody out, but the, but the general sort of rule is the bigger the projects, uh, the directors have their own vision, and they're not really interested, in my opinion, too much, you know. <laughs> and fair enough, you know, that's not what I came to school for. I'm, I'm, I wanted to make noises for movies, and that's what I do. I'm generally reactive to what I see. Um, I like to get the script as early as I can even if I haven't started on the show yet, so I can start to plan for what might need to be recorded. Because if, say, we have a, a shorter schedule, six weeks, eight weeks to do the film, and there's a lot of stuff that needs recording, I'd love to know ahead of time what that might be, so I can start even thinking about mm -hmm. concepts and what tools I might need to make the sounds with. But uh, I think some of the, I actually thought that the smaller projects, I know over in, um, in Europe, the smaller independent projects, sometimes, I know some, some uh, films 
that won't start shooting until they've talked with their sound supervisor because they want mm. to get input on what shots they might need and wow. what might help, which I think is really refreshing and I would love to be a part of that, but in my general rotation of schedules, I'm reacting to what I'm getting and it's, and it's usually I don't see anything until after they've stopped shooting. Hmm. About 90% of the time, the job just comes after it's been done. I think they do the job and they think about, at least in my business, uh, think about uh, they get bids from multiple companies and then they figure out who they want to go with. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we, when we're doing a job, we do get a, a phone call before the shit job is, is done and we try to discuss what, how to do a certain shot possibly, but it's not the norm, at least right now. Uh, for my smaller company, I'm sure for bigger visual effects company, getting in on the ground floor when something starts is is a was obviously a big a big deal. Mm -hmm. So you can plan how to shoot it, but most of my stuff comes already done. Already a done. Big fix it in post. <laughs> a big fix it in post. <laughs> so when we when we talk about picture lock. Um, and, and when editorial what is, is, is that? What yeah, is that? right. <laughs> I knew how this that happened like happen. 20 times. Like you have final cut, final cut, final cut. Picture lock version One, 20. two, three, ten. Um, yeah. Then there's the overcut. The overcut. <laughs> so how, um, what, what tools are, are you using to stay ahead of those, those picture changes so that, um, you're not reworking from, from scratch? Um, and, and trying to stay, you know, as, as current, um, but still being creative through iterations as they come through the pipeline. I'll take it, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's actually a great point, the picture lock thing, because so much of our job, which people don't understand um, in general, is that we, the movie you see in the theater is nothing like what we work on, generally mm -hmm. speaking. You're talking about the big movies like The Hobbit and stuff like that, and you, th you look at it and you see it's beautiful and all this stuff, and you think, oh wow, they had this much time to work on it. So much of our time is spent keeping up with picture changes and visual effects updates that we try to get as, um, uh, on an early cut, we try to get as much material as we can done that's good, because we know we're gonna just be dragging it forward, trying to patch it all the way through to the end. I mean. Real one of uh, the third Hobbit movie, after we pre-mixed it, had um, at least three changes that were over 91 edits uh, a piece. And this was after we'd already pre-mixed it. And this was like with the smog thing flying over Lake Town and all that stuff. And, and you know, we had that thing working great with um, smog shot to shot. It wasn't just like cut to cut, you can chop it up. And then there were the reorganized shots and everything. So it was, uh, it was a nightmare just trying to keep that thing where it would even play. Uh, the tools we use are, in general, it's, a, it's an app called Conformalizer, mm -hmm. and that accepts um, EDLs from the Avid. And the thing I love about this system, which is r relatively new, um, is that with the EDL system, you can, you can pick and choose when you're going to make the f conform. Like sometimes we get a picture, you know, three picture changes on the reel in the same day. So do we want to be patching it when we know another version's coming? No. If we know it's coming, or if we're, we know that reel isn't gonna mix for a while, but it's likely to change again, sometimes what we'll do is skip this version, skip the next version, skip the next version, so we can jump from version 20 to version 25, and then that's just, you can load EDL for version 20 in, 25, you skip all this stuff in the middle, and it just adjusts it so that it matches those two, you know, you're updating your new version to as, as few breaks and uh, chops as you can. So conformalizer. It's conformalizer. Yep. Long, long it, version. I'll exactly. second that. that. And the new version with the video feature is incredible. Video feature. That's true. That's a good point. That's a, that's a new feature in there that you used to have to get EDLs from the picture department. And at least in LA, they're, they're, they're slowly starting to be willing to send us EDLs. The, the picture department has a lot of power mm -hmm. on the post process. Um, you, we can't wag the dog. Um, if we, as, even as supervisors in the sound, if we say we really want EDLs, if the, if the picture department says we don't send EDLs, we're kind of screwed. Mm. So we, we really hope that they will, not yeah. just send us a change note. Um, but the new version of Conformalizer will analyze two videos. You, don't, you, can, get, you can get a change um, by comparing the two videos that will compare the picture frame by frame and generate a change based on that, even if the picture department won't send you EDLs. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. I've, I've noticed in a lot of 
independent projects that we're associated with where the, the picture edit never changes. The, the very first um, project file uh, or sequence in Premiere is the sequence in Premiere, and it continues to just be that. Uh, and if there wasn't a version from where they changed it last, then, then we're, we're forced to align it just, just by eye or by, mm -hmm. by comparing video. So it would be great to have edit decision list um, every time that there's a picture change and a new version in the, in the project. We try to do that a lot. Um, is there, when, how, as, as you go through changes, um, do you, do you see there being great dividends of, of payback where the picture is evolving in a, in a, a really positive way or, or how many times is it just moving stuff around for the sake of moving stuff around? Uh, that's, that's a creative decision by the, P people above my pay grade at that point, <laughs> so we just make it happen. Into the main I worked on something just recently, which I can't name, <laughs> um, but <clears throat> the the picture changed 32 times in one week, and I would say that the improvements were minor. Minor. <laughs> it was a lot of work for very little payoff in my view, but again, that's above my pay grade, and I get, pr I get paid to keep it in sync and put, put, put sounds right. on it. So, so I don't really complain about that, but that's, that's the result, I would say, is it's not often, you know, it's right. a lot of wasted time. Where we could be doing productive work to make the, the soundtrack better. Yeah. Usually the changes on my side are more um, uh, artist-driven. They don't like a shot of themselves or something, so mm -hmm. there's a change order to, change order. to do, to do a, a new cut or a different shot of the, the artist. The artist. So Priscilla, as a, as a producer, what's, what's going through your mind as you're, you're making changes once you've gone into the post-production process? Well, it depends because in the TV shows that we made, uh, obviously we don't have too many changes. Probably you have two or three, probably like, I don't know, six. Mm -hmm. That it's too much, and it's because probably we don't like how the sounds uh, was, but we don't have to do any type of sound editing, and I don't like too much. Mm -hmm. But uh, probably we will have to do a lot of lighting. That's pretty much what we're going. Like we have our struggles, mm -hmm. or the I don't know. Probably if we don't like how the host made it, we say okay, let's do it again. Or less, in, in several times we made interviews with like famous uh, artists, and we have to call them back, and that's like pretty much what we said. Like it's per, it's better do that mm -hmm. instead of I don't know uh, broadcast that because pretty much the people will see that, and that's why one of the biggest problems if you don't have budget because if you have uh, in a certain way like a really bad editor, mm -hmm. obviously you will pay less than that and that's why they are talking about yeah it's more money yeah but more money means that you're going to have a good edit and a good edit is like everything because people will not look at your work or something if they see those like uh i don't know any type of errors in a certain way that you didn't did in pre-production so that's really more imp important for me that the budget if you have it look for a good yeah. one now, Frank, it, uh, having both hats, when you make a choice to, to make a change um, in your film or a film that, that you have your hands on both sides, I mean, that's, it's got to be a tough decision. You're like, I, I need to make these picture changes, but I know I'm going to be up all night trying to get the audio to come back around and be in sync. So <clears throat> how, do you, how do you schedule that? And when, when do you say, okay, enough is enough? And when do you, when do you back off? Well, nothing's ever final. It's just released or online or whatever. But it, it, it's, it can be hard. Now, a lot of the work that I do, like corporate stuff, you know, marketing videos or whatever, like that's the changes coming from the client, mm -hmm. you know. But like with, with my film in particular, you know, my, my partner, the director, and I, you know, we made these decisions and it was painful because, as you know, because you mixed it, mm -hmm. we, you know, it was done. And, you know, you were like, wait, well, I have to open this thing back up. And, do, and for me, it's not even like a, the biggest issue is time mm -hmm. because I have so little right. time 
you know, and so that hurts. It really does. It's like, oh, well, I guess I'm not sleeping again tonight, mm. you know, or, or I'll, I'll see my kids next week, you know. Yeah. But, um, and that's really the hardest part with any of that is just goes back to kind of a work-life balance thing, which is a joke because there really is no balance there. It's mm -hmm. you're working, especially in a freelance, yeah. you know, aspect. It's hard to say no, you know, because you don't know what's going to happen in a couple of months. So when you have a change like that, um, it just sucks up your time and then you're just behind the eight ball, you know. Can I add something? Yes. This, uh, when we're talking about changes, how many of you guys are filmmakers or directors and all that? Awesome. Mm. Um, what I would suggest you do is, which I don't know why people don't do this more often, but I would suggest you follow your audio department one time and see what, what they do all the way to the end. Because I know that some of these changes we get, the picture department thinks they're doing us a favor. <laughs> Every time they make a little change, they go, oh, we need to send this to sound. This will help them. We'll send this. But they know they're going to keep working in this reel a lot more. But they send us this little change, and we wind up changing the whole reel to match this. When, we, when they even know themselves, another picture edit's coming. And I think a lot, of it, a, a lot of directors and picture departments just don't understand what we do on the back end. And if you follow through, see how much work we do keeping it up, you will start to send us changes less, which means we can keep improving your product instead of, instead of just patching up temp work. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times a temp track gets released because that's the only thing we've had time to do is keep that in sync and keep it going forward. So follow your audio department, audio department and, and, and you'll get a better sense of when you can supply them with picture, I think. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. It really does. I, I'm getting ready to finish a film that I'm working on with uh, Jeff Unai, and we talked about that because they were making a bunch of changes. I conformed the film one time because they just were like, nope, we're going to give it to you all at one time, you know? Wow. And that, yeah, that was pretty awesome. And just in the last year, I, I just finished um, supervising that Gore Verbinski movie that's coming out, Cure for Wellness, and he has a way of making his films which is unbelievable, which he builds his, his film from the ground up once the editing starts, builds it with sound in mind as a tool um, in the Avid, and once he finishes his cut, he's like, I've made that decision. I don't want to have to make that anymore. Mm. And when we, we did get a little round of changes right before premix started. Um, two days before premix, we, he did a rebalance and stuff like that. But after premix started, he didn't change a single frame. And that enabled us to just keep moving forward on the movie mm -hmm. as opposed to keeping up with changes. Mm -hmm. So it was, wow. it was fantastic and unusual, I'll say. I mean, mm. we're, most of the time we're just yeah. chasing changes all the time. How are you collaborating with the filmmakers through, through the, the process? Um, what, what tools come to mind what have been the most useful for um, keeping track of where, where the project is as far as the timeline? Uh, sharing assets or, or even just conveying where changes need to happen? Uh, most of my jobs come in pretty much complete. They're, they do do fixes and changes along the way, but they're usually pretty minor. Sometimes a job will come in uh, because they know we need a lot of time. It'll be pre-edit, pre-finished edit and pre-color. So it gets, it gets really tricky moving all that stuff around because we, we start the edit without being finished and we start the visual effects without being colored. So there's a lot of hoops to jump through when it actually finally gets locked. We have to do all the shots again with the color. Mm -hmm. uh, we run, rerun it through everything. So, But our, our client-facing um, infrastructure for software is every, basically every piece of sh file sharing software you can think of because some clients like to use uh, can I name name Dropbox or sure. Hightail or we use Shotgun? You know, you name it. We probably have a subscription for it. I was going down the list. I'm like, can we eliminate some of these? But mm. the cl all the clients have different things they like to use. At least I'm not sure if this is the question. But yeah, I know. Um, we we use multiple uh, interactive online file exchanges mm. to work with the client. Do you host your own as well? Uh, we don't anymore. Okay. Uh, it just seems too dangerous these days. Mm -hmm. We we let them take care of the security. Okay. How about you, Frank? 
Dropbox, Google Drive, you name it, you know? And more and more now, as far as keeping up with things, it's it's having Skype calls and FaceTime, you know, with and just being able to see the person while you're like, okay, this is what's happening, you know, whatever. But as far as, as, far as file sharing, it's just like he said, like everyone uses something different. Now, I don't like Hightail, and I don't like those ones where the file gets deleted after X amount of time. Like, I'd rather have Dropbox, Google Drive, whatever, where it's on my machine as well, because they, they're they like, oh, yeah, he already has that, and it gets deleted, then I'm like, oh, crap, I need to go back. Oh, where to go, you know? And th that just happened to me on a project. I'm like, I need this. Where? Oh, it's gone. What? Urgh. There's there's expiration dates or no expiration on those, but anyway, um, I, th there's a few tools in these like uh, that have markups where you watch the video and you can actually you can make notes right on the video and, mm -hmm. and ti it time codes and, and, it, and it gives information back to the person that sent it and they can find the note and see it and it, it, you can do a lot of uh, remote collaboration this way with with clients or with with artists. It's it's kind of neat. It's pretty. Okay. Well, in my case, I, I don't prefer anything about WeTransfer. And every time that I send something for an editor, they send it in WeTransfer. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> OK, so pretty much what we do is like, obviously, I have it in Google Drive or, in, I don't know, in too many hard drives that I have in my house. Because obviously, we don't have like a, a complete a panel or something for that. But pretty much, if you can make a lot of copies in hard drive, at least, mm -hmm. that is something like it's cheaper or instead of using we transfer like he said that probably you have a deadline you have four days six days mm -hmm. and you need it that's like the best way to have your files or any type of footage that you need in case someone i don't know delete it or mm -hmm. you need it like after i haven't used it yet but recently i've seen that wired drive has a premiere sharing link so you can literally edit with another person with all the files mm -hmm. in the cloud Mm, that seems crazy. No, that's. Are you guys using that? No, no. no uh, but it. I yeah. know, yeah. No, it looks it. interesting. I, yeah. I'd be interested in seeing how that expands into other mm -hmm. pieces of software. So everything just stays in the cloud and you have a computer terminal working on it. That's right. Now, uh, David, sometimes you get to work out of your home studio, but you're still working on, you know, big budget films. How do you, how do you manage and deal with the security of, of getting the media and working on it and that doesn't happen m much anymore, Not anymore because um especially when um skywalker was bought by disney Ooh. that's very they have a very strict policy on what uh, what can leave the facility or not so i don't work on any of that stuff at home anymore we have to use a sparrow we can't use any other transfer devices um to get the files to us mm -hmm. the the movie files then live on the server at skywalker and that's the only place they can go. Uh, when I'm working at home, it's on other things that, that don't mind. That don't things mind. like Blizzard will send me, you know, uh, videos and stuff like that. As far as like collaboration and how do we know what the changes are, the, that, that communication is almost non-existent. You know, we have to, when we get a picture update, we use, again, we use Conformalizer and there's a, uh, a window panel in there that can compare. We can import the old movie and the new movie and you have to, Basically, our, our, our update system is uh, to have the assistant go through, compare I, I, shot to shot, and it, and it overlays. For a whole movie? Well, you reel by reel, yeah. Reel by? Yeah. I, I just can't believe they don't send you ADLs. It would just, it's, it's astonishing <laughs> to me that you don't get an EDL. Well, we do. We generally do. That's, and and oh, okay. these days we do. Okay. But um, we still have to step through the shots because they don't tell us, oh, this shot's changed, this shot's changed. We have to go through it shot by shot and see and uh, then it's an overlay window that shows you the differences in the two pictures mm -hmm. and um, then you can determine where what's changed is conformalizer just for audio yeah it sounds neat it's pretty awesome it is we have some in video but i i don't i uh i think resolve has a change for doing color if you get a change edit it'll pick out what's you've already done and just apply that to the whole edit and then it'll tag the the new files that aren't mm -hmm. colored one of our one of our benefits with independent feature length films is that if we can get them into color correction, usually the picture edit stops because <laughs> there's no more money to go back into color correction to make those changes. <laughs> so we strategically try to book color early 
before I, we go to the salad mix. I, I've had to do a lot of color matching when that happens. Yeah. They don't want to go back to color, so they make me do a couple color matches. <laughs> We're doing final mixes to picture now, print masters to picture that isn't even final. I mean, you know, visual effects will show up after, <coughs> after we print mastered it, which is supposed to be the final product. You're not supposed to touch it anymore after that, and we're, we're guessing sometimes on, the, on, the, on these big action shows, you know. Do you at least get to open back up and... It, it's not our call. Not it's, your you call. know, we can, we can point it out to the studio and say, well, this is missing and this is why. Okay. And they can say, they can, okay, we're, we're going to open it back up or not. Because they've already made all the different yeah. audio deliverables. Sent it off on to the DCP. <laughs> that is all packaged, ready to go. And, oh, yeah. look, visual effects. The <laughs> dragon's going this way now. Um, yeah. Hands wrong. Wow. I mean, uh, creatively, you know, a lot of that stuff just goes by because things get lost in the mix on purpose. You know, we, we're going to not play this sound because we don't want to hear it. You know, so the audience a lot of times doesn't go, oh, there's something missing for that. You know, uh, right. there were some instances um, in the second Hobbit movie, I believe it was, where the um, where Smaug's foot comes down, and it was, mm -hmm. and we never saw it before before it was released. So there was a huge shot of Smaug's foot just going, and there was nothing. <laughs> and yeah, I think we fixed it for the for the Blu-ray. Oh. And I, it's an interesting thing because I don't know, I'm getting really off topic. You, 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 oh. you, Really? Well, you know, I, these days I sort of feel like the feature film is almost just like a commercial for the Blu-ray because you can go back and you can fix it and put it on Blu-ray and you may think you saw something in theater that was different. You go, oh, I guess that wasn't like that because it's not on the Blu-ray. So it can be changed for forever because the Blu-rays are what live forever and it's in the theater only for a little while. Can you imagine when we're no longer on disc formats and it's just a stream that can constantly be updated and two years later like hey go put the footstep back in yeah <laughs> that's incredible um as 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 we finish up you know being in the world of post-production if you know if you had you know a, a golden ticket that you could you could make a change and and everybody would follow suit what what would be your your contribution to just kind of you know, reimagine the workflow uh, to make the, the process better uh, with future filmmakers here maybe listening to, to make the world of post-production a better place. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, would, it would be great if the color information could transfer to any program just at, as like a, an, a color, like an EDL. You mm. could have a color EDL that just... Yeah. The color file goes wherever it goes with visual effects or ed, uh, editorial finishing. Um, it's a, a self-encapsulated color lookup table or something mm -hmm. that goes with every file that way. And and well, the kicker. The kicker. It's if it's it could be connected to the original color box, and if it's changed, it changes that color file. That would be cool. So if you if you go from the source, it just populates back out and but fixes it. You everything. have the edit, say, in Resolve yeah, or something, right. and the whole edit is uh, linked to an online XML database or something, and wherever that file goes, it calls home and knows what that file's color is. Ooh, I just might have made a product. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Shh. Erase Shh. We should. <laughs> you didn't hear it here. <laughs> I'm full sale. I might own it now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You are in full sale. <laughs> But pretty much what these guys are telling it is true. For me, in this case, as like as a producer side, uh, obviously you have to have also a graphic, a good graphic designer, because for me that is another thing that is really important for for the um, I don't know in this case film or movie or any type of audiovisual project that you are making, because probably you have a good uh, movie, but you have to know that soon you have to market it, that movie, or I don't know, the TV show, oh, that's pretty much that if you can have that budget for a good editor and you can have it in pre-production, it will be awesome because it will save a lot of things in production. So, Frank? The biggest thing for me is I want to have a way to take a session, let's say whatever, it's Pro Tools. And I want to be able to take that and open it in another DAW, Logic or Nuendo or whatever and have 
all the information come across. Right now we have AAF files, mm -hmm. OMF files, which do transfer some metadata, you know, automation or whatever, but it uh, doesn't do panning, it doesn't do, you know, no plugin structure comes across, anything like that. And I actually just four months ago switched to Pro Tools from another system called Fairlight, which I think is the greatest thing on the planet, but I can't go back and forth between the two just because there's no common, I don't know, standard of f the way they do their files. I see Frank's constant frustration coming out on Facebook from these programs. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is massive. I wish that, you know, the standard in the industry is Pro Tools, right? Avid is the standard. There's no arguing that. But some people prefer to use Nuendo or Logic or Reaper or whatever, and to be able to collaborate with somebody, you know, more easily between DAWs would be amazing. But you're talking about competitors yeah. coming up with something to, you know, allow someone to use another program is never going to happen. Yeah, it's the, you know, the, the part of software development that rarely gets enough funding um, because it's, it's back end process, you know, the, you know, when you're talking about, I, I do a, a logarithmic fade or a special fade on a file that I want to translate over to this other editing system that, that process and, and development code is, is not impossible, but it's just not funded to, right. to, to, to do so. Exactly. Um, one of the, th you know, things that we've discovered with the, the new, newest version of Final Cut X is, um, roles. I know it's 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 uh, you don't you don't think you know, there's a there's a still a, a large group of people in Hollywood cutting features in Final Cut Seven because they they know it and love it um, and and it works for them. What was interesting when we started breaking down Final Cut X and, and roles is that you can start assigning camera audio to a role and the production sound from the recorder as another role and sound effects that would be hard effects to picture. As a, as a as a role in music and backgrounds and foley and all the different elements that you would work with, and as the editor is going and placing them in the in the storyline, uh, it will automatically distribute and organize them into where they're supposed to be. And working through post production at a at a hurried process, we have best plans and practices of these tracks are where we're going to put these things and these tracks are going to be for those things and we always end up at the end of it with audio track one with this track that isn't <laughs> named anything and what is that oh that's that extra yeah. footstep that we needed for for real five and there's two people in the world that know what that that file is yeah um whereas it once if you could assign roles to it that anyone going through could just assign a role and then the computer could go through kind of in the same way with what you were talking about and the idea of color, that it could go out into the world and just say, I'm dialogue, so I will always be known as dialogue, even if I'm not named well, um, would, would, would save us uh, so much time. Mm -hmm. uh, time warps too. I wish time warps would translate to every other program for any other program, but you always have to end up re lining up your time warps. Or, or dips to black becoming dips to, to white on, on resolve and <laughs> or logarithmic versus linear. Exactly. Before you before you know it, um, there's just so much of undoing what the other application has done to to get you to the to the final uh, final timeline where you can actually start working. It's, mm -hmm. it's it's remarkable how much preparation is involved before we can even be creative, um, just managing these different softwares. Um, when you get into um, file formats, um, what are some of your biggest struggles now um, that you, you're, you're just starting to see that you, you might not have seen like five years ago? Uh, HDR is starting to become a big thing mm -hmm. and we're uh, in, uh, my, my personal software is changing all the time, the way it handles color information. Uh, every file has a different way that it's produced out of Alexa versus red versus uh, Canon, and so it all comes in in different color space, and, and they recently changed it, so it's all confusing to me right now. But um, I digress. How about you, David? Are you? I don't really have any struggles with file format changes. You know, maybe just picture codecs. Pro Tools not being able to play it back or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, you know. 
how long ago have you started using Reaper for a sound design tool? Um, I started on the third Hobbit movie using Reaper a lot. Yeah. So with with Reaper. Or design only. Yeah. Pretty much for design yeah. only. Um, but you, we were, we were talking about Reaper this week, which is which is a really cool um, design tool. It has a has a demo that's functioning that you that you, that you can download if you want to try it out. But um, one of the things that you were talking about was the ability of bringing files that were different frame rate, uh, not frame rates, but sample rates and right. and and um, file formats and working on them together. Yeah. Like how how has that helped you where Pro Tools would have would have failed you? Oh well, it certainly frees me up creatively a lot. Because if I'm working in my, in my SoundMinder database and I have a Pro Tools design session, if I drag, drag something in that's 192K and I'm working in a 48K session, it's, it, Pro Tools forces it to match the sample rate and it would make a new audio file. Not that disk space is expensive anymore or anything, but I, I do like dragging something in to Reaper and not having it make any new media at all. And then I feel completely free because I've got like, you know, 600 old DAT tapes that I've digitized and they're not split out into different IDs. They're the entire 120 minutes of audio. They're in one audio file. But if I want to say grab this one train car slam that I've got in the middle of this thing, I can just drag that into Reaper and it doesn't make any new audio. Where Pro Tools would have had to, had to make a whole new audio file for me to play with that one little piece. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes it, I don't have to second guess what I want to try anymore. I just, I just do it in Reaper. Or sell our Frank. Well, that's why you need a sound editor or something before, because pretty much in my case as a producer, I don't know how they manage the tracks, how they manage probably the deliveries and all the stuff and the format. I know everyone, but that's the important thing. If you can uh, be surrounded by people that know what they do, because for example, in the cases that we say all the time to the editors or to the sound editors, like, okay, we need it for tomorrow. Okay, you you have it on Friday. We need it tomorrow, and we need to fix this big issue that we have right now. And that's pretty much why they don't sleep. They tell you, okay, but you are not letting me too much time for to doing this. So pretty much, that's one of the I think it's one of the uh, biggest reasons in our thesis here in Full Soul that most of the bill in this case told us like, okay, you. Th yeah, like a group, you think about this when you are going to do the sound effects for we have like a explosion, and obviously we in that moment we shoot the like the scene, but really we didn't use it at all, and we think that it works, mm -hmm. but when we have in 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 post we'll say no, let's cut it off, and was like two weeks like trying to combine one of the our directors because he won that shot. And that's pretty much when you have to have everyone like in the same page, so they can, uh, for example, like you said, like that's true. You don't need this. That's true. You need this. So, pretty much um, try to be aware of those things before you go to post, because there's something that, for example, you can say, okay, we fix this in post. No, there's. I don't have any issues with file formats. I'll just convert it to whatever I need. If they sent me something wrong, you know. And Literally, the only issue is, like David said, maybe a, a video format that a codec that won't play back in Pro Tools or something, and I'll just convert it. So I'll just convert it. Yeah, I do find there's issue in video anyway. With the, we have color space issues mm -hmm. where something comes out and it doesn't look like the color that it was was meant to when a client's looking at it, and they it doesn't happen as much now, but it used to with uh, a quick times gamma correction, mm -hmm. auto gamma correction, and just the directors would go crazy. Like, why does this not look like what I did? Oh yeah, there's there are many times of exporting things out of Avid and then the blacks don't look the right way anymore and having to, to go through what was the horrors of making um, DVDs mm. of try to run it through the whole process and look at it and go, no, that didn't work, and then go through and set the... You guys change. missed the whole time of tape and delivery of actual physical media. <laughs> now you can just zip it off the internet and deliver. It's amazing. Ha are, have any of you um, still forced to do tape media, or you're all file-based? We're all file-based now. Absolutely files. All file. Yeah. Such a... The, I mean, there's still the occasional film or mm -hmm. commercial that needs a HD cam or a, a HD cam SR. Mm -hmm. But you have to rent the deck. and You can actually... Those things were... $100,000, and you can probably find one for five grand now. You don't remind me. 
Don't remind Frank. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. <laughs> so being in, uh, in an all uh, file-based workflow, how are you dealing with duplicate files? <laughs> they just stack up. <laughs> they just stack up. <laughs> Buy a new hard drive. Yeah. Well, uh, sometimes you want them, you know? Yeah. I mean, for safety copies and stuff right. like that. I mean, I, all my projects I have on three different, you know, drives. But, I mean, it's going to happen. I did a search in, in my sound effects database the other day. I was looking for something, and I noticed that things were coming up like three times. I'm like, what is going on? And I went and did a search, and I found I had, you know, two extra copies because I had done a backup, and it was searching that, too. I'm like, what? You know, it's you just got to man. I mean, file management is, it, I mean, it's super important. It's super, you know, super pain in the butt, mm -hmm. but it's just, you know, it happens. There's duplicates all the time. Don't really have that issue. Don't really. <laughs> Cully's more organized than I am, apparently. No, just don't, <laughs> don't ever make duplicates. I don't know. <laughs> we have a vault. Maybe there's some in there. But Our projects come in, and we work on them, and then the drive goes into cold storage for a couple of years, and then we donate it to somebody if they don't pick it up. Oh, OK. Mm. Duplicates happen, like Frank says. I mean, we usually work in, in films. We work on a, a, a one session per reel. And you know we may work on the same, use the same sound effects across different reels. So if I'm spotting them from sound minor into reel one, it may spot the same sound file into reel two, but they go into their own folder. And I kind of think that's a good thing, because um, not to have duplicates, but that the audio files that live with that reel live in the same session mm -hmm. folder. And mm -hmm. it's okay if they're in two places. If you go to archive this all in one place and you scan it back into your library, then yeah, you're going to have mul you're going to have multiple returns when you go to search for it, mm -hmm. and that, that happens too. Then you have to do, then that's a pain in the butt, and you got yep. to go try to manually figure out where what to remove. We we went through that uh, that today with the, or this week with a project where we opened up a project, and most of the files were there. Some of the files were on 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 Frank's personal computer, and it's amazing with technology now that his son, who does no Pro Tools or anything, we're like just just hit the button, turn the machine on, get it on. Okay, now open up TeamViewer. And if you haven't Team experienced TeamViewer, Team it's, it's how I, I support Frank's Pro Tools system from far away. It's like I can see the entire desktop, I can move the cursor, we're moving files off of a local drive onto Dropbox, taking it from Dropbox, bringing it in, putting it onto the drive, and before, you know, five, 10 minutes later, the session is completely up and running and everything's fine, where, you know, not too long ago, it was like either someone has to go back to Virginia, <laughs> grab the computer, yeah. and drive it down here. Someone's getting more and things like that. They were just a lot more difficult to use. Yeah. There's VNC. There's a lot of old. Oh, VN oh yeah, VNC. Yeah, that's yeah, like definitely. 15 years old. VNC is. We've yeah. been using it for a long time. But TeamViewer is just so easy. Team yeah. I actually have been servicing my whole studio occasionally on my laptop here when there's a problem. <laughs> the problem you can just open it up and go. So with so many different paths that you can go in, in, in post production, what is what is some advice that you, you could give to students be, because there's so many options of, of where to start? And, and uh, Me personally, I, I'm a small company, and when I worked at another company, I, I was an artist, but I also got into IT and, and tech because they needed it. And I filled, a, I filled a job that they needed and became indispensable, so they couldn't really get rid of me at any time because I ran the whole place at that time. I was an artist. I also ran the servers, the website, um, you know, did all the file archiving and the file management. Uh, and I just, you know, I made myself uh, invaluable. So if you get into a place and you're just an artist and you see a job that might need to be filled, uh, and if you can do it or even if you can't, try to teach yourself to make yourself invaluable at that company. Well, I agree 100%. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. You know, you make yourself so valuable that they can't work without you, no matter what role you're in. Mm -hmm. I mean, that really helped me start my own business because I could do it all at that point, uh, not just an artist. Mm -hmm. So when I started my business, you know, I, I built all the computers, I uh, did all the networking and the infrastructure and uh, licensing, the whole nine. It's not the prettiest thing, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it works. Okay, so now we're going to transition into questions 
uh, from the audience. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and then there's, there's going to be microphones on the left and right side. And um, anyone who is watching the stream online, there's, there's representatives in the back that will, will be able to feed your question See, This is one of the most us. technical panels I've been on. <laughs> very, very specific stuff. I, we have one I can only see a hand in the front row. Everybody in the back is just kind of falling off there. Yep, right behind you, there's a microphone. Ah. Hello. <laughs> Thank Hi. you for the panel, first thing first. My question is for you, Mr. Bunker. I am not sure if you already talked about this uh, yesterday, but mm, I wanted to know where you come in in the production phase. Do you like mm, come in in the pre-production phase? Do you have a say in production phase uh, when it comes to shooting in green screens and stuff? Do you have a say like if you shoot it in this way, it will be the best to work in pro, um, post pro or does the files like hit you on like hit you hard <laughs> after it's done um personally it, it's like 80 to 90 percent um i just get the things that come in they shoot it on their own and it comes to me but uh the other 10 to 20 percent um i get to go on set or go into pre-pro and we plan how to do the shot you know we request the right kind of green screen that i i prefer and make sure your your you know the lighting is going to work for the for the for the shot or um, you know, try to put tracking markers up for a set extension. It, it really depends on the degree of effects, I think, that the project has. If there's going to be a high degree, I would say that the percentage goes up that they'll give us a call. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they just wing it and then fix it in post because it becomes a big deal. Because mm -hmm. uh, we're actually working on something right now that I didn't get to go to set for, and they called me for a quick consult, and I told them how to do it, and they tried it, that didn't come out right at all. We're, we're not thinking the shot's going to work at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just sad because it, if they would have kept it simple, I think it would have worked. But they, they tried to do a few things in the shot that uh, I rack, they tried to rack focus and they wanted to combine two camera shots together. And one's in a different focus point than the other. And then there's a lens flare that a guy's head goes through and not in the other shot. So there's lighting differences and focus differences. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, I don't think it's going to work. It would have probably been better if I was on set for that. So, it's 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 just it's all over the place, really. It's, it's, of course, it's better if we're going to be prepared and in pre-production or at least come to set. But I find sometimes they don't they don't listen to you on set too. But when you get out yeah. when you get fi in the final phase, they're like, "You were there, but you didn't ask me, and you didn't want to." <laughs> it doesn't matter. You were there. <laughs> you should have you should have been more more uh, poignant in your points. <laughs> I believe we have a question on the, on the left side. Hello, everyone. Um, so my question is for all of you. How how much time, like, during the production of the project, do you start working on post-production during the filming of the project, or do you, like, um, wait until the project is finished uh, filming so that you can start working post-production? And, like, how has been that process in, in like, the different projects that you've worked? Well, in my case, I can, the only thing that I can do before editing is like the graphics, something like that. But then I have to wait until we're done editing or something because, for example, if you have an interview or something, obviously you want to pick the most important things of the, I don't know, the talent. And obviously you will have part that you say, no, we don't need this. Or at least you have like a time that you have to put in a broadcast, I don't know, like one minute, and you have an interview of one hour. So you have to pick those things and you have to wait until you're done. Me? Okay. Well, for us in sound, um, it depends obviously project to project and what they're willing to pay for and stuff like that. I would say the general um, ideal set up for us is um, if, the, if the picture is being shot, a lot of times there's a picture editor on the films that's constructing a, um, a rough cut while the director's still shooting. And sometimes they will request sound effects from us um, as that's happening. But we generally try not to provide too much too early because a lot of times the director isn't involved with that cut at all. They don't even see that cut until after they're done shooting and they mm -hmm. come back and look at it and then they just throw it all away 
anyway. But um, so we try not to be, to be on too early, but we'll, we'll be on as early as somebody wants to pay us. But we try to keep as few people on at that stage because we're not really feeding them that much material. Um, once the picture edit starts, they start requesting more. So then we'll, we'll ask for more people to be on for that period. But generally then they're still constructing a picture cut to show to the studio. And the studio usually doesn't care about sound at that point. They're trying to figure out, do they have a movie or not? Do they need to right. go out and do reshoots? Do they, you know, uh, do they need to hire a new picture editor? You know, so generally we don't get started really heavily until after they've shown the movie to the studio once, because generally once the studio sees it, they have lots of suggestions about what to change, mm -hmm. um, what to reshoot. And if we've come on too early, it's kind of wasted time. Um, but again, we're happy to, we're, we're a service industry, you know, so we'll do whatever people want. And some directors want, they think that, that having sound on before they show it to the studio will help their product look better to the studio. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. I, I find that um, they will lock visual effects in the edit before anything else so they can get that out to us so we can start working on it. But the editorial is still going. And sometimes that changes and sometimes it don't. Sometimes shots we're working on in a film get omitted. But yes, a lot of, uh, in a lot of films we get shots before the edit is locked. And even after it's locked, those obviously change. Uh, but it just it's an organizational uh, achievement to just make sure you know what's what's still in the in the cut and what's not. So the producers work together uh, with the showrunners and just make sure that any, any if any shot is omitted from the edit, we get we get a, a, a change order or a kill order on that. Or if a shot is extended, mm -hmm. you know we get a change order on that. So it's just it's really organization at that point uh, when you start working before picture lock, and even afterwards. And most of the films that that I become. Uh a part of, I, I work as a post-production supervisor, so I have a luxury of, of working with filmmakers in pre-production. Um, and they, the departments that I always mandate that I meet with are the, the production sound team and uh, the digital image technician or data wrangler. Uh, and if we don't have a, a plan in place of how the sound files are going to come in, how the, the camera files are going to come in, and where they're going to go, and how they're going to get organized, and um, how many archives uh, are made of that footage. Uh, and to justify to the independent filmmaker that, um, yes, it's going to be 18 terabytes of storage, and yes, you need three identical sets of that, and yes, it's going to cost a lot of money, because having a my book three or six terabyte drive that has every bit of footage of the file of the film it's it's shot in red it's been cut in final cut and there's one sequence file that contains the entire movie is probably the most scariest thing that that we hold because hard drives fail all the time and it's and, it, and they give it to us and they're like can you can you finish with this and you're like the last thing i want to do is touch it yeah so having that conversation um allevi you know alleviates a lot of anxiety with with me to know that the right people are in place uh, and that there's there's someone in production that that cares about post production being successful in the end. On that note, most of the time that I know my, my clients, they have a copy. But sometimes if it's a new client, I'm like, is this your master? Do not give that to me. <laughs> Make sure that it is cloned right away. Yeah. Oh, and, and on a big on a big movie, they don't even ensure the footage until it hits tape. They mm -hmm. capture it to two. Oh. They capture it to drive. Make two drives, and then they put it to archive tape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. and and. I specifically um, do not use the term um, backup. It's even weird for me to say it to you guys now because backup in, uh, kind of assumes liability. Um, so when that, someone says, can you back up this drive for me? It's like, absolutely not. There, there, are, there are services out there that do checksum analysis and cloning drives to make sure that these blocks are, are copied over and everything is identical with these two drives, but you could make an archive of one drive to another and this drive for some whatever reason doesn't work and now they're like, well, you made the, you know, backup. Um, so uh, a bit of advice, never never say that you'll back something up for them because it can come back to bite you. Or more questions? Sorry, if uh, hands were up. I, yep, right over here. Um, thank you for the panel, by the way. Um, my question becomes that there's been an influx of of content that's meant specifically for like digital platforms like Netflix and all of this like online streaming services. Um, he mentioned that he was working on a Blizzard video. Uh, 
-hmm. So my question becomes, has these new digital oriented um, content, if you will, changed the, your norm, regular workflow? And for you, Priscilla, as a TV producer, um, since you have a specific codec for your broadcasting, do transcoding that for like a streaming service, like a like a Go platform, something like that, take how much time would that take for you guys? And like, how do digital streaming platforms change your regular workflow from a sound standpoint, from a color standpoint as an independent filmmaker? For me, it doesn't change anything. I'm doing something for YouTube Red right now, and it's just like a, a broadcast, just like a TV spec, you know, nothing's really different. Um, and the process of creating stuff is the same no matter where you know it's going um you know david talked about the you know it's in it lives in the theater for a short amount of time and on blu-ray forever you know it doesn't matter if it's theater blu-ray or yeah. youtube you, you still go through the same creative process to to get it there um the only thing that may change is they might have a different uh, dial norm level that they want or peak requirements as far on the audio side yeah. You know, on the video side, they might have a specific file format or, or something like that. But um, the specs actually for YouTube Red are almost as, well, they might even be more detailed than the ones I have for like the BBC. You know, I mean, they're, it's very much the same. In, in our case, we, we deliver a master file to the studios uh, and they take that file and they, they distribute it to all the distribution uh, means. They run it through a, a server. I'm pretty sure, I think this is how they do it. They give our master ProRes file and they disseminate that into the different codecs uh, through the streaming services and on air. Uh, and so it's really, it's, it, it's almost handled by another company. There's a whole company that does that type of thing that uh, some, sometimes you go direct. I mean, you put it on YouTube yourself, but uh, if you're dealing with the bigger studios, they have, they have services that do that. In our case, in the TV channel, what we really do is like we gave them like, for example, they, sometimes they told me like, give me the master file or something. And we always like shoot in 4K, just in case you don't need it because you will not, bro uh, we don't broadcast at 4K, just HD. But at least you have the option if you can, for example, make a close up or something, you don't pixel that, I don't know, the interview or something. So pretty much we give them the master file or in some cases we only gave it like HD and that's pretty much. And they obviously convert it in one of the formats that they have. In, it depends on the TV channel too. So it's pretty much what we do. We give them HD and they convert it. It is, I think it, is, it will change uh, soon because of HDR and 4K. There'll be probably different, different release releases that we have to give. We may have to give an HD, a 4K and an HDR. I know right now Netflix is requiring everything that's done at 4K with HDR, but they also have to do an, uh, an HD uh, down convert plus uh, a non-HDR version so they can stream to both kinds. So. Mm -hmm. Most of Look. what, um, when we're delivering films, um, it, it goes to a, a third party company for a quality control um, testing and they'll analyze um, analyze the picture and we'll give notes and feedback of, of double frames, double black, frame, black, black frames, missing um, frames, audio crushed, drops. crushed blacks or, you know, and then we have to then go and interpret the list and then talk about, um, sometimes in our disposal, we have directors creative intent. So if we decided to push the blacks and add grain and, and it's noisy and it's intentional, we can say that. And then we can, you know, uh, omit that note. Um, it happens a lot. <laughs> we did uh, we did a film called Last Shift, and the film opens in one eight five, and we we put in our own two three five or two four zero mat, and then there's certain scare scenes that the director intended to go back out to one eight five and get. Um, I luckily had a conversation with the DP and the director and said, you have to open the show in 185 because when you screen at festivals, they're going to just mat it for 185 and you don't want to mat it for 240 and then just have it shooting on the, on the top and bottom of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the screen. But we made it all the way through to, to um, iTunes and it failed. And uh, luckily, if you know the movie Real Genius, <laughs> the end of the movie, there's... There's uh, an anamorphic shot 
that goes into uh, letterboxing. And we, we cited that as an example of, yes, this is intentional. Yes, this is why we did it. Um, and it and became a, a huge problem for us because we have two options. We have a show that's got 185 content and 240 content that is completely color corrected with vignettes. And we could either do a 240 only show and introduce vertical pan and scanning or completely recolor the show in 185 because all the vignettes have to be changed and shot. So it seemed like this wonderful creative concept that the director loved and at the, the, you know, the last hour of distribution, it prevented the film from from being sold. Hmm. Um, so every every uh, every choice, picture and sound, can can have some consequences. Are there other questions? But I can't can't see if hands are raised. Anybody from online from the back or? Good. Uh, hi guys. Um, I was wondering how you guys typically handle um, archiving of file projects after the project is done. Because I know from personal experience, like I'll wrap a project and have uh, a certain amount of space in my hard drive that I need for future projects. So I'll end up deleting hmm. project files, and it turns out I may need them later to make changes that the client wants. So I'm just wondering how you guys typically handle saving those project files or archiving them, or if you get rid of them, how do you handle that? Uh, personally. We have a lot of hard drives. Yeah, a lot. Uh, they, our clients give them to them, and then they forget about them. So we, we have a lot of hard drives that we just use to, hard, to archive. Uh, normally, though, I, if the project is something that I'm, I want to use in the future or I want to come back to because it was a good project that, I, that I, I'm proud of, uh, I'll archive that job and, and keep it around for future possibilities. But otherwise, just delete it. And just get it out of there. We always save our final files, and I'm using Dropbox uh, to back them up. I've got a, the business account, so just all my finals are up on Dropbox and on a hard drive in my studio. So, um, yeah, it's just it's just kind of up to you. Uh, if you don't have hard drive space, that's a tricky one. But uh, you know, keep the ones you love, and maybe just move on from the ones you don't. Yeah. But it's really difficult to delete something. Yeah. <laughs> Every time that I I don't know, I had need a space. I prefer to talk to any friend, like you have a hard drive that can take a little, just for two days or something, while I buy one or something. So I prefer to have everything just in hard drive. I have like 20, 30, I don't know how many I have. But something that is really important if you have hard drive is that you have to be organized and put, okay, this is this, uh, like the date, everything that you did in that uh, project, try to put it organized so when you want it or you want to uh, look at it, you know what it is. I have a, a system where <clears throat> I have a network attached storage that is uh, 12 terabytes. I put the, uh, anything I finish, I put there to be backed up and then I go from there to LTO tape. Mm -hmm. And I have a spreadsheet that I log everything that goes to LTO, and because I don't have 400 drives like the rest of these guys apparently, um, <laughs> so I just use the same drives over and over, you know, for a while. But I, I just everything goes to LTO. I, I handhold the the director and producer all the way till we get an approved QC um, report, and and once the distributor has all of the assets, then it's like, here's all your drives and do, do what you want with them. And typically, we don't delete any of the files. Uh, I'll give the drive back to the to the producer and be like, attach it to your computer and format it. And, and then if you want me to use that drive, I'll use that drive again. But there's just something about the, the, the client's media on the drive and be like, you want me to format this? Yes. And then you do it and they're like, wait, 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 wait. Uh, and, it, and it can be final. Um, it, it's crazy. These they drop off their media, and after the job's done, they either forget about it, yeah. and then it sits here for a year at my place. I'm not going to call them and specifically send it back on my dime. No. So I have hundreds of hard drives, yeah. and after a year, I go to format it, and I, I'm still afraid. Yeah. But it's been a year. This thing's been online or out in the theaters for whatever, yeah. and it's only happened a couple times. But I did get a couple calls once in a while. Hey, that hard drive you had a year ago is it around? I'm like, ah, you must have picked it up. Because <laughs> <laughs> that one got recycled. That one got recycled. Yeah, it's 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 a. You, you know, how do you know? You know, that's yeah. kind of a weird area in this business. Like, how do you know when you can take somebody's media that and just get rid of it? 
Mm -hmm. you know, we've we've done a, a few films where we've had a you know finished color. The on online masters are at that color house, and we're waiting for for a distribution deal. And that process takes eighteen months or whatnot. And we get emails and calls of like, "Hey, your show's still on our server. I kind of want to move it off." And, and, and we're like, "Well, we're." We're almost there. <laughs> you just have to, you know, as as a post soup, you're just calling them like, "Hey, can you can you keep it on for a couple more months?" Because they're they're still dealing with some stuff. And then it's so it's so great to be like, "The show is sold. It's done. It's out." Um, it, it's funny you say that. I have a Nick Cannon movie on my hard, my server that's just sort of taking up everything. And I called him the other day. Oh, there's changes. It's been there for a year. Yeah. So I mean, and when a film is is there for that long the, the the desire to change it from the production side just grows and grows and grows and maybe the only reason why it hasn't sold yet is because that real one needs to be opened up and and it's it's a tr tricky time it's so. just sold that's why there's changes oh it just sold that's why there's changes. okay perfect any questions from over on this side yes we have one right up oh, there we go microphones flying in there we are thank you hello again my question is for Mr. Farmer now. Yes. Uh, for visual effects, you know, you can, can actually sh tell what kind of uh, visuals you like, you want, because you can draw and show. But what about sound? Do you, how do you create sound for something imaginary? How do you, how do you, how does somebody explain to you what, if it's an alien, how would you tell? what kind of sound it is going to produce, or how do you imagine a sound? I wish I had that answer. Um, um, communicating sound is an art form that I don't think very many people have mastered, because uh, it's so abstract and you can't point a picture at it. Most of the time, what people do is reference another movie they liked. You know, like if they're doing a dinosaur movie, they like T-Rex, you know, and I'm like, oh God, uh, how, do, how am I going to do that? So most of the time, it's, it's so abstract that, the, that you will get, we'll get people saying, oh, it needs to be more green or something like that. And it's like, um, yeah, OK. <laughs> so you know, you know, basically, the, the process is um, we'll, I'll get a shot or a scene, and I'll work on it, and I'll do my best that I can come up with, and I'll send it to them, and they'll just give me feedback. A lot of times, it's reactionary. Sometimes you get a director that's, that's pretty specific. They, they kind of know what they want, they, mm -hmm. but they may be, if it's, say, a monster, they may describe it low and growly or high and screechy you know, to make sure you're starting in the right place. But a lot of times, the director is reacting to something I've given them um, first. They let me, usually, they'd let me take a stab at it first. Peter Jackson was always like that. He didn't really give us too much direction what he wanted it to be. He was like, okay, you go, here it is, impress me, you know, and so you uh, so he left us to our own to sort of generate the material. Does that help at all? Kind of. <laughs> I'd imagine right. you just start doing stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you mean how do you come up with the concept for for something? You know. I was just curious. I Well, I think it's it's just an art form like anything else, you know. Uh, I don't know. I always had an interest in it, and usually when I see something go by, I sort of know, I sort of hear it in my head, you know. I guess it's the same way a musician would write a song in a, in, in a strange way. It's like I sort of hear what I want it to sound like. Now, getting that out of sounds I've recorded, a lot of times I get lost on the way because I have it. I have the sound in my head, and as I'm messing with things to try to make that happen. It's not usually what I heard in my head to start with, and then I get distracted by what I'm hearing, not what I heard in my head, and now I can't remember what I heard in my head to start with. So you get lost along the way a lot. You have to play around a lot. But having a sensibility for whether a sound sticks to the screen or not, 
Mm. You know, that, that's when you, when you I like, I like I know when I was working on the cave troll, um, I would, had a whole bunch of different versions for it that didn't work. And all of a sudden it just fell in the pocket. And then it was like when I stopped hearing the sound I was using for that and I heard the cave troll instead, I was like, now I know it's working. But when I can, when I can hear the sources I made independently from what I'm seeing, I know it's not working. Mm. You know, but all of a sudden when it falls up there and now I'm hearing this character instead, then I know it's working. I don't, I don't, it's, it's a, it's a really gray area. Uh, I find, I, I love that, that time when you, when you just go and you're working and it's crazy and then you're just like, wait a minute. Yeah. Just, you know, back off. Don't, but yeah, you got to let go. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause sometimes you want to noodle a little bit more and then, and then it's lost and it never mm -hmm. comes back. Uh, we have time for one, one last question. If anyone has a question, I'm just, I don't want oh, see a hand in the back. Okay. Um, so my question is for the audio guys. Um, how, how closely or if at all, do you work with the composers in terms of like, um, this hits this, we need a big thick sound here, but then the composer also puts a big drum right there, you know, on both of those sounds. So do you communicate directly with them or does the director kind of be the middle guy there? You want to go first? Sure. Um, it depends on the project and depends on the director and depends on the composer. Um, the film I'm working on right now, <clears throat> the director communicated directly with the composer and told him what his vision was for it, and, and he's creating that, and it's coming to me, and I'm listening to it, and I'm like, okay, it's just a stereo mix down. And once I compile my notes, I go to the composer, and I'll say, you know, that's great, but can't make sure I get that separate, you know, or whatever, because I did sound design in this scene that you don't have you know, that it may, you know, mm -hmm. pile up or something. Um, but sometimes, you know, on the projects I work on, like the corporate stuff and whatever, like they, I'm the only one talking to a composer or if there is, even is a composer, it might be library music. Mm -hmm. um, so it really just depends. But I'd like to have as much communication as possible right. if there is a composer so that I can ask, you know, I can give feedback. I can I can have things changed if it's if he might do something that's a cooler sound design element than than I did, and I'm like, oh, I really like that, you know. But and there might be a sound that I hear that I'm like, what you know, what is that? Why is that there? You know, whatever. But um, so it, I guess the short answer is as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Please, thank you. You know. <laughs> I would say very little in my in my world. We don't get to work with a composer very often. Occasionally, um, Cure for Wellness. I worked with the composer a little bit more, but I really didn't have any much inf influence over it. It's usually the director that has that influence. And your point about having uh, something hit at the same time as a sound effect. I use this example all the time. And in my way of trying to influence the composer is to tell the director, you know, composers have a choice where they can put their sounds. I don't, mm. you know, in something mm. like that. Like if it's, an, if it's an explosion, I got no choice but to put the explosion <laughs> on it. Mm -hmm. The composer can move that cue wherever he or she wants, before or after. You know, action and reaction is what we tend to say. Like the, the sound effects are the action and the music is the reaction. Mm. Don't have them hit at the same time, please, because then neither one of them gets their, gets their shot. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you know, and in fact, one time, I won't mention the project, but I had the composer actually request a scene we had done because he wanted to compose around it. And so we sent them a, a mix of what we had done. And um, a co-producer got word that we had sent some sounds to the producer, I mean to the uh, composer, and he said, how dare they? Um, like, how dare we send what we'd done to the composer. He didn't realize the composer had asked for it, mm. but composers have tremendous clout in, in the soundtrack. They get paid a lot of money, uh, more, way more than we do, you know, and they get residuals and everything else. So they have lots of interest in making sure that their cues get in the movie, over the end credits, things like that. So they have lots of power. And, uh, and also directors, a lot of times, don't want anybody else making those decisions mm -hmm. who, you know, they don't want 
necessarily us coming together. And I know that it sounds like the film business is a lot of collaboration. A lot of times it's not. It's, it's one person trying to make sure everybody else gets their vision done. Mm -hmm. And they don't want us collaborating because they want to get every, everything to the mix and then they choose. Right. What I love it's about the, the independent projects that we have is we, we get to, to know the composer early on in the project because there's, there's not a whole lot of money and we're like with, with was Frank was saying earlier, doing package deals based on how many reels are in the film and how much screen time we have. We, we start divvying up the, the pie of post-production funds. And because of that, I like to sit down with a composer and talk about moments that they want to hit and talk to the sound designer about where they can contribute because they're trying to manage this with other projects to make a living, so to speak. So to have them both try to cover everything wall to wall uh, is inefficient. Uh, and I, I find that getting them to talk to each other, um, especially now that we can collaborate with video, um, works really well. And we don't find too many times on the mix of, of people kind of trampling on top of each other. Um, the big thing that I like to do with composers is as fast as possible, get them a track of the movie with dialogue. Because when you get composers that write music over dialogue that don't pay attention to the dialogue, then we get big problems. Because music that's played big and loud sounds horrible when you have to pull it down in the mix to just make room for this one line of dialogue to come out. But if they write around it and make pockets for these words to, to live on, it's, it's so much more of a better experience. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys uh, on, the, on, the, on the panel, Priscilla and Frank and um, David and Cully. Um, and for you guys in the audience, uh, that's the end of the time today. Have a, a great day for the, the rest of Hall of Fame. <laughs>